Hey everybody, welcome to The Secret History, Living in Your Aquarium. I'm Alexander Williamson, and you guys are back with me here today to learn about how to test your aquariums for their parameters. So today we're going to talk about how to test for parameters and figure out, almost like a puzzle, what your parameters in your aquariums are doing, even if you don't have test kits handy. So almost all of the variables that are in our hobby, in our aquariums, can at least be uh, hinted at or alluded to by signs in our aquarium, if not concretely proven by simple things you can do at home, even without these test kits. Now, nothing does replace a good test kit uh, or you know even a 10 or 15 dollar TDS meter like this one here your five-in-one test uh, test strips or kits that you can get and your reagents they're all great and I highly recommend that you guys still get them but if you don't have them and more than that if you want to understand the natural cycles and ecology of your aquariums especially your planted tanks then I think you're going to really enjoy this. So let's go down the list of these tricks that really help you understand all your nutrient profile for your plants and what's either too high, too low, just right, and things that may impact your invertebrate brits, your shrimp, your fish, and your snails. So let's jump right in. We'll start with the important things, talking about uh, nitrogen, nitrates, ammonia, that kind of stuff. And then we'll go into uh, the ones that affect plants more. But some of these overlap, and some of them, when you know one or two pieces of the puzzle, you can then deduce or figure out the missing part that you're trying to sort out. So let's jump right in right now, and I hope you guys enjoy this one. All right, so right off the bat, I want to encourage you to just take a look at your aquarium. Get to know your fish and watch them. I mean, that's why we have these, right? So one of the things that I can't encourage enough is to get a species that you understand very well. So for me, one of them is these rosy loaches. And I can tell when they're in spawning color, like this guy here, when they're happy, or when they're totally translucent, the males, I know something's wrong. The nitrates are high, there's ammonia, something's off. Same with these radnocentris. These are a rainbow fish, and if they're not showing their red and their black, then I know something's off. I want to show you guys a few more examples of different fish you can use, some for uh, hard water and some for softer water, so that you guys have some more ideas of what you could use as these kind of canaries in the coal mine for your aquarium. Now, don't let me stop you by just what I'm suggesting. Any species that has changes in its physical appearance or its activity works great for this and can tip you off to something being wrong in the aquarium. So let me show you a couple more of these and if you guys have any more, please write them down below in the comments. I'd love to hear if you have a species that you always put in a tank so you can kind of keep an eye on things. Just as we can use fish as these canaries in the coal mine or barometers to tell us how our tank is doing, we can also use plants for this and algae for this. When there's algae, there is usually an imbalance of certain things. And I have whole videos on algae, but what's important to take note of in this picture is that this tank had crashed and then it rebounded and had too much nutrients but what I want you to take a look at is this Rotala Innie. And it has pink right where the problem started to get fixed and where I added the supplements in. The same thing is true of those Rotalas in the back. See how they're red at the top, they're pink at the top. And the transition happens on each plant throughout all those different species of Rotalas back there. There's about four species back there. They all have that same shared characteristic of leaf shape, texture, color. All of it is very, very clear where the change occurred. 
Likewise, you can tell if they're photosynthesizing well often by seeing if there are bubbles on them at the end of the day. If there are little bubbles on them, it means that they are photosynthesizing really, really well. Now this isn't giving you any parameter, but it's just a nice hint. So what are some other hints we can use uh, from plants to tell what's going on overall before I get into literally how to tell what your parameters are? Well, just about my favorite is Cabamba. So you can get Cabamba, Americana, Lini uh, Caroliniana, Bricotta, there's a, there's a variety, but you can get to know it. And the things I want you guys to notice are one, how far are the leaf nodes spread out? So where do the little branches start and where are the little rings where branches are versus stem? If it is long in between those, it means it's been growing very fast and up towards the light. It's reaching for the light. If they're closer together, you know that it either had enough light or it didn't have enough nutrients. So if you know you've been doing fertilizers and things and it looks all good and healthy and stout, then it may just be that it didn't have a ton of nitrogen. It may just be a very dense and bushy plant, which is what some aquascapers and, and plant growers want. But what I want you to do is to take a look at this plant and check out what it looks like in another tank. So Cabamba in another tank is bushy and it has kind of this iridescent uh, shimmer to it that's kind of a bluish color on the tips of the leaves. And it's much more like a shrub here with the sections closer together and more forks on each of the branches. But that's not all. Let's take another look in another tank at how different this same species can look. So here we have the same plant, and yet it is red. This is Cabamba furcata, and the nodes are far apart down here because there isn't enough light, and it's reaching, and so as it gets more light, the nodes get from being really long in between to shorter and then being spread out. Once it spreads out, then it changes color. And it can only change color if certain things are going on. And in the case of Cabamba, it will not turn these bright red and pink colors unless it has low nitrates, nitrites, and ammonia. So I can tell just by looking at that plant growth that the last few weeks or month has been completely low on nitrites and nitrates. Even in stems that I cut that were lower down, you can see them turning color and some of them are turning really red really fast because they're closer to the light that's right here. Now, another great plant that you can use for this is going to be uh, your, any of your uh, all right, so another big one that a lot of people know is the rummy nose tetra. Rummy nose rasboras work too, by the way, but they're even more sensitive. So you want that really red head there uh, and the silver, almost blue body and the stripes in the tail. If you get them stressed, though, they start turning translucent in the body and not blue. The tail will stay fairly striped generally, but then the nose will start turning pink or peach and if they get really stressed, you'll actually lose all of that. You'll start seeing some of the, uh, this is probably ammonia burn on the gill and even around the eye and the soft tissue. Another fish that I love using is the ruby tetra because they are exquisitely uh, beautiful and they really like low pHs like 5.5 to 6.5. You can see these silver bandings on them. You can see all the orange and even a little bit of white on their fins when they're really happy. And uh, then a fire red on the tail with a, a peach to uh, an orange on the body, like a reddish orange. And then they'll turn faded. And finally, they'll get this bad where you can only see that little red spot. You do still see the white here. Uh, if they get even worse, a lot of times they'll get sunken looking. But again, look at the gills. They look a little red. Uh, so that's another sign. 
So these are all basically acidic or neutral fish. So here is a, a Pseudomagill luminatus. These ones like really uh, oxygenated water and they like water with low TDS. So they can tell you a lot too. They look magnificent uh, with the little spots on them and the blue and the orange and the eye being so bright. But if you, uh, if you don't treat them well, they start to fade a whole lot and they can fade all the way to washed out completely if uh, you're not careful and to the point where they get uh, ammonia burn again. So the gills tell you a lot, sores on the fish. And another one, this one being for harder water, uh, this, this isn't completely accurate in that this is a female, but this is the same strain of guppy. So look at, she's very healthy. She's got full color in her tail and uh, that luminescent shimmer to her, uh, which is actually the same chemical that we're gonna talk about in a moment that is, uh, it's called anthocyanine that, that uh, helps build the shimmer and helps cause all blue and dark red pigments. Uh, carotenoids also help with red pigments, uh, but there's whole other videos on that. So she's full in the belly, looks good. Um, she's translucent here, so it's the red is not a bad sign. Uh, but then look at here how stressed she is. The yellow is showing not good at all. All right, so after the signs of our living fish, our living plants can tell us oh so much more about all sorts of things. So on to the other living thing that you need to take such close note of and learn what each species does because some of these are just general rules for like Anubius, Java fern, uh, and, and plants that are common, Ludwigia, things like that. Uh, some of the plants may act differently, like some of the ones that turn red, like the Rotalas. That's because of low nitrogen. Uh, but look at this we've got severe nitrogen deficiency you're going to get holes in the leaves no brown just yellow and thin thin leaves number two calcium deficiency is going to be twisted leaves twisted veins um, and magnesium overdose could also do this so if you've been dosing a bunch of you know powder or liquid in the tank for the plants and uh, that you start seeing them get twisted probably know that that was the option. If you don't know, you know, if you didn't do anything, then it's probably the calcium deficiency. So, so many of these things take knowing what you did before, after, and the specific plant or animal. But once you know these things, it can tell you so much. So again, number three on the list here is iron deficiency, greenish veins on the uh, leaf and the older leaves will fall away towards the bottom of the plant. Phosphate deficiency, which is another critical thing for plants to live, um, regulates their metabolism, is the yellowing or death patches on older leaves, and the leaves fall apart rather quickly. It looks similar to nitrogen deficiency, uh, but it's yellow and brown rather than just uh, the yellow on the edges of the, the holes and dead spots. Uh, magnesium deficiency, you get dark veins and lighter colored leaves. Uh, and and uh, for uh, a healthy leaf, this is the picture they give. So you guys can take a screenshot of this. I can share it for the members of my channel. It's only a buck ninety nine to join as a member if you want and I'm always putting resources up like this. Here is another iteration of that where they just show that like uh, manganese can show the white spotty look. Calcium is the stunted misshapen leaves sometimes with little spots on it. Um, nitrogen uh, can be like yellow on the outside and on the veins um, but not so much the brown. There can be little holes in it and then the bottom of the plant the leaves fall away. Uh, leaves also die from stunted growth, from not enough sun. They can turn pale. Uh, magnesium, you'll get that brown like you, like, like you will see on my, uh, my java fern, or my uh, bulbitis that's uh, an African fern coming out of my uh, aquarium. It has uh, some signs of this and probably low nitrates as well, uh, as well as low potassium with the yellowing also. 
Uh, so there are lots of these charts you can find online, lots of little um, little things like this, and they're all they're all very handy. I like the ones with real pictures if you can find that. And then it gets into some real specific stuff like boron deficiency and things like that. This is more um, land plants and so forth, but you can find information sometimes even on a specific species. So with all that said, with keeping track of all of our living creatures and uh, your substrate and knowing what you've done recently, the real test you still need to do that you can't just observe and deduce your way out of is going to be the pH because you can't tell just by looking at it. Even ammonia, sometimes the water gets frothy, you get the burns on the gills and the behavior change in the fish and the color change but you won't know about the pH without this. This being anthocyanins, the thing that is purple in vegetables when the ground is neutral, or when the vegetable is neutral rather, and it is blue when it is basic, and it is a fuchsia all the way into a red when it is acidic. And this, by boiling this in distilled water, just a cabbage, a purple cabbage or grape skins or an onion, you can actually create your own test kit at home for dirt cheap. So let me show you what that looks like. And also uh, one more little scale. This one's not super detailed, but uh, there are some that are more detailed uh, scales. I thought I had them on here. But in any case, you can look them up and uh, you can actually tell within at least a point, if not half a point, once you get used to it and you can make a whole jar really cheap. So now on the plant side of things, I want you guys to take a look at something. And while this isn't giving you the specific parameters, I hope this, got, this gives you a uh, idea of how much you can read into your tank when you understand the species that are in it. So this is Cabamba furcata, and if we look at where the nodes are, or where the branches start, this space in between them, or the internodal space, is very long down here where it's hidden under a bunch of vegetation. As soon as it gets light, they get much shorter to the point where they're very short, like less than even a centimeter apart at the top of the crown once they are up and into the light. Now beyond that, the color goes from being a lime green to a yellow to an orange and then to a red. The really cool thing about this plant is Cabamba will not turn its colors, so whether that's purple uh, Cabamba from Cabamba Caroliniana, like down here, or Cabamba furcata, or Hagurensis, they will not turn that bright color unless it is a low nitrogen environment. So we know that there were no nitrates or nitrites uh, above around 30 or 40 parts per million on all these plants because we can see that they're that color. Now, this isn't the only plant that does that, and in fact, there's a whole lot of plants that in low nitrogen will show off red color, whereas before I, uh, you know, cut back on the nitrogen or when the tank was more stocked, you would see a uh, color that's different. But here you can see that purple on the same Cabamba plant, but the other plant that's great for this is Rotalas, and you can really tell a lot by how far the spaces are in between things. Uh, even on these wispy Rotala ennies, you can tell the same thing. And at the top, they're going to have color. Uh, a nice purple or lavender color here, and a bright red over here in this other uh, variety. So you guys will have to figure out which plants do well in your aquarium, but I love this plant uh, in particular, the Cabamba and the Rotalas, because they also don't do well in hard water. So I also know that if the pH goes above around 7.5, they'll start to lose their leaves. And also, if the TDS goes over around 400, they'll start to lose their leaves and they just won't grow well. So that is a big tip for me. You guys are going to have to figure out what the tips are for you based on your fish, 
your plants and as you get to know each species then you can tell a whole lot more about what's going on and that's what we're going to go into on this list is how you can tell things by for instance how your plant is getting holes in it or how your uh, plants are turning colors or what their veins look like all these things can give us hints on what is going on, what nutrient is deficient, what nutrient might be too high, and so on and so forth. Before we get into that though, let's knock out some of those main parameters that we were talking about. So for instance, pH, how can you figure that out without having any real test kit? Well, I have an entire video on it. And that entire video is about making your own testing solution at home. And in this jar, I have enough for literally thousands of tests. And just like the test kits where you get a color and you match it with a chart, there's charts online you can match with anything you make out of anthocyanins. Now, I will pin the video and I'll try to add it as a card also, but I made this simply with distilled water and red or purple cabbage. Using the chemicals in there, they turn different colors all the way through the rainbow based on what the pH is. So, using this and adding a few drops to your tank water you can figure it out. There's a whole video on it because it is a little in-depth, but I just want you to know that for less than 50 cents or a dollar, I was able to make a huge batch of this. All right, so let's move on to the next item. So next up, when talking about the next item, I want to talk about our TDS, or Total Dissolved Solids. And what that is, is that is if you took a liter of water and you boiled it, or actually let it evaporate would be even better because then it would take less particles with the energy of evaporate of uh, boiling rather than evaporation. Uh, evaporation would leave all the particles in the bottom and whatever settles out, however many milligrams are left, each milligram in a liter of water that evaporated would be a part per million. Or another way to think about it is out of a 10 gallon aquarium, one eyedropper is one part per million approximately. Um, and that's with a scientific eyedropper, not the cosmetic kind. So what I want you guys to think about next is, okay, we, we know the pH range fairly closely. We know within a point. So what can we deduce after that, we can deduce the nitrates were low in this tank. Uh, we can guess if these were all green, that they were high. So when we're trying to figure out total dissolved solids, what we're really usually trying to figure out is how much calcium and calcium carbonate are in the, the water. So how much carbon is uh, available in the soil or in the water for our plants, especially those without roots, like epiphytic ferns and bucephalandra and things like that, mosses, versus uh, how much calcium is available. So remember that chart I showed you guys with all the little uh, pinholes and different color leaves and things? That's where we can then come in and make some general assertions. So Anubius is a really great plant to know what's going on here. We see yellowing along the edge of that leaf where it's been chewed by uh, some little critter. It's, it's probably one of my plecos going a little too hard. But what other clues can we use in our aquarium to know if the calcium might be a little high? And that would be snails. So snails start getting these white bands on them if the calcium or carbonate or calcium carbonate is too high in the aquarium. Uh, if it's too low, what you'll start to see, and these ones are actually just right, but what you'll see is that they have a completely smooth shell that has none of that, and it's very translucent. 
So if we move over to another aquarium, sorry to make you guys dizzy, but if we move over to this aquarium, you can see where the old shell in the center there, there's actually what we call plaques of extra calcium. So at one point, this tank was a little too hard. It had a little bit too much calcium. Now, other than for plant reasons that we looked at, like, you know, causing holes or growth issues, why might that be an issue? And what else might be able to tell you something about that? Well, your shrimp, because shrimp need that calcium and that carbon just like snails do for their exoskeleton anything with an exoskeleton is going to need it and if your carbon uh, and calcium or your kh and gh um, which are whole video topics on their own and so we're just coasting over them right now if they are too low what will happen is you will notice that your shrimps, when they molt or when they get their exoskeleton, they will get a ring uh, around them. And you'll notice it right behind their head where their tail starts, and they won't be able to get out of their exoskeleton. They call it the ring of death, a lot of shrimp keepers. And believe it or not, it can actually happen when there's too much uh, carbon or calcium in the water as well. Now this isn't the same form as the CO2 in the water. This is a, a different form that is usable uh, metabol for their metabolism in a different way than the gases are. But here you can also see this shrimp is starting to outgrow his exoskeleton and you can see there's clear space on the tail and he's going to be wiggling out of that soon. So if that space isn't clear, or if the legs and antenna don't have clear extra space on them, and it's a milky white, that's a really good hint that there is too much of that in their ecosystem. So what else can we tell with, with what's going on here out of our main parameters? So the big one that a lot of people want to know is going to be ammonia. So how can you tell if there's ammonia? Well, first of all, if it's really high, it's possible you could smell kind of a cat urine smell or even a human urine smell, but your fish are probably passed away by that point. Although humans are very sensitive, and I have another whole video on all the things you can tell about your aquarium just by smelling it. And if it smells swampy versus if it smells like eggs versus if it smells like sewer uh, versus if it smells like fresh soil or mushrooms, uh, they all mean different things. And I encourage you guys to watch that video. I will also put a link to that in the description or pin it in the comments. But let's talk about how you could spot ammonia. So ammonia, your fish are going to have gills that are turning red and they will be at the top gasping for air uh, because their gills within 24 to 48 hours will burn if they have over around one or two parts per million of ammonia. Also, they'll probably turn very pale like we saw before. You may not know why your indicator species fish have discolored, but it will let you know right away, I better get my test kit, or if you don't have a test kit, I better start deducing what could have gone wrong. It's always a puzzle and a challenge, and the more you learn about each species that's in your tank, and each fish, and each uh, ecosystem, and hard water versus soft water, the longer you keep each, the more you'll intuitively be able to know, ah, I think it's going to be this or that. And so, the other thing I want to mention while we can see it here, is this is a protein film, and I only know that because... Uh, my water is incredibly soft. When it is calcium, we actually get a white buildup closer to what this tape residue looks like. And so looking at the water line of your aquarium can also help you figure out your total dissolved solids like we were just talking about a minute ago. So there's all these different clues like shells and, uh, you know, did you add crushed coral to your substrate? Uh, is your water usually hard in your area or is it soft? What do your snails, what do your shrimp look like? 
uh, and what do your plants look like? What are their deficiencies? Um, when the edge of the plant is sick, is it turning brown and yellow and then green? Or is it just brown and a hole? Or is it pinholes? Or is it little white chalky holes? Like the chart showed, which you can freeze and go back over, it all tells you different things about all the plants in your aquarium. Now it's also important to know like, oh, I have plecos in here. So these holes are not gonna be caused by a deficiency right now in here because I dose all my micronutrients and macronutrients, but you can see that the holes have clear margins and that just means that the pleco was chewing through them. Uh, you got too rough on the algae that was there and one of the plecos probably just ended up chewing a hole right through it. But it's really important to know these things and know, okay, do I have plecos in the tank? Do I have a snail that could be eating it? Do I have an apple snail or a mystery snail that might munch on it a little bit? Um, mystery snails don't usually do that a ton, but sometimes they will take a few bites or be a little hard. Algae eating, uh, Siamese algae eaters are another one that can cause those holes. But whenever you get those holes, it's a chance to take a look at the plant and see how healthy it is. And likewise, bulbitis or java fern, or, or this is bulbitis hedulata, but any of the ferns are great at showing a lack of uh, potassium, manganese, magnesium, and iron. So you can actually see uh, colors on the underside of the leaves. And if they grow up out of the tank, those colors express themselves in the same exact way, but more... Uh, exaggerated on the actual entire leaf so just another tip of things to be looking out for so what else can we figure out once we know the TDS approximately uh, we know whether it's hard water or soft water with that we know whether it is uh, acidic or basic what else do we need to know so you can use all these clues by learning species profiles on your fish. So that's why it is so crucial to learn about your plants and your fish and to find things out like for instance what does it mean when there are little pinholes that aren't caused by any of the fish and the leaves are falling away that are older and they're yellow. Well refer to our chart and it's going to tell you that that's probably a lack of nitrates and potassium. Uh, could be phosphates a little bit too. But when you add all these things together, you start to be able to figure out, ah, this tank's a little low in that. This tank's a little high in that. And it all can be done starting with very few pieces of information. A lot of these you may just happen to know yourself because you're the one who built the tank. You know the species and what they do, you know which ones are sensitive to uh, acidity versus which ones are sensitive to basic conditions. For me, I know again, these gouramis, they will not do well if the, if the pH goes over about 6.5. So the water stays very close to a little under neutral or 6.5 in this tank. So I hope this, got, this gives you guys some inspiration. Also, another good sign is always when your fish are uh, showing spawning behaviors and coloring up. But I hope this got, gives you some inspiration and some ideas on how you can check some of these things at home. We're getting fogged up in here, guys. So it's probably time to end the video. But I want to very much for coming along on this ride, learning some of these tips and tricks on what can help you understand how your ecosystems in your aquariums are working. And thank you for watching. Uh, this is going to be what you need to know uh, in the future <laughs> uh, about plants and algae and cyanobacteria, which is another element that you may need to know on this journey, uh, especially if you don't have testing kit ingredients. All right, guys, I'll talk to you next time. Please like, subscribe, share if you find it helpful, and uh, I'll see you on the next video. Thank you so much. Bye.